Hello again, everybody. I'm Scott Casper, along with Tony Hager, and welcome to this week's edition of Global Wrestling News. Four of USA Wrestling's top stars, Jordan Burroughs, Adeline Gray, Helen Marillis, and Andy Bisek, were featured as part of the U.S. Olympic Committee's Team USA Media Summit. Tony, did you know they were having a summit? I, I did not. No, I no, I did. They have one before every Olympic Games. Well, as part of the Media Summit, the wrestlers held a major press conference hosted by USA Wrestling's own Richard Emmel. Here's what the 2012 Olympic gold medalist Jordan Burroughs had to say on being a leader and an ambassador for the sport since winning gold just four years ago. Um, Jordan, since you're, you're the cool cat on the block, uh, talk about how to make wrestling cool. Jordan has uh, so many uh, great ideas on social media, has a huge following. Thank you. But, but talk about you know, your sort of uh, role in providing leadership for the sport in that way. Absolutely, so I think in 2011 when I've made my first world championship team and then won the world championships in Istanbul, Turkey, I was kind of thrust into the position of ambassador for the great sport of wrestling. And I wasn't prepared for it. And so afterward became an immediate process of, if this is even a word, groomification. I had to be groomed into this position to put myself in the spotlight and be comfortable with it and understand that the weight of the wrestling world was on my shoulders and I was dependent upon to make it cool on a grassroots level, on a youth and scholastic level, and now on an international level. And so with each quad approaching, I think that the job becomes bigger, more responsibility, more awareness, more expectations and more pressure, but also we become better athletes more mental toughness, more preparation, more confidence in our abilities. And so now, the only thing left to do is win. We've done all the work, we've prepared up to this point, now we just gotta execute. The wrestling world is 100% on his shoulders. Uh, it has been since he did win that gold, uh, nationally, globally, but he, he really has paved the way for wrestlers to just really act out in the media. You never really saw a whole lot of people get socially interactive with their fans and he has just been able to take that to another level and, and make money by it so he has paved the way I think for future athletes to get their face out there and doing so responsibly and I like that Adeline Gray who has five world medals but no Olympic medals explained how big of an opportunity she has to become a first Olympic gold medalist for the US in women's freestyle Hi everybody, my name is Adeline Gray. I'm a three-time world champion in women's freestyle wrestling and the United States does not have an Olympic gold medalist yet for Team USA, and the opportunity to go in and be the first Olympic gold medalist is just be really icing on the cake for uh, wrestling in the United States for women. I think it's really groundbreaking right now what we're able to do, and uh, the, the opportunities that are really budding and opening up for college scholarships, for women getting to travel and make national teams, and, and we're just ready for that Olympic gold medalist, and I would love to be the person to fill that shoes, and I'm, I'm hoping there's multiple of us. Um, I have a very strong team headed into Rio, and, and Helen and I are one of them favorites to go in and win gold. 2015 world champ and three-time world medalist Helen Marillis has been wrestling since she was seven years old, and she'd seen the growth of women's wrestling, but she hopes her Olympic journey can kickstart her future in really growing the sport on all levels. Hi, my name is Helen Maroulis. Um, I've been wrestling since I was seven years old. When I first started, I didn't have the same opportunities that a lot of the guys had. I had to grow up wrestling on a boys team. Um, but as my career has progressed, I've just seen so much growth and change. Uh, I've been a part of multiple campaigns that have um, really supported uh, growth in women's wrestling. And I think as of right now, it would be incredible to say after this uh, Olympic quad that not only did we have, you know, six gold medalists for the women's team, but that also we're having women's wrestling get added to D1 college schools or Ivy League schools where girls growing up can have opportunities not just to wrestle in the Olympics, but to get an education and wrestle as well. So that's been really dear to my heart. Um, I went to Canada to go to university to get my education and wrestle, and both those things are really important to me. So I'm hoping that my Olympic journey can uh, kickstart into the future and continue to grow women's wrestling. Andy Bisek has also been a big part of growing the sport at the Greco-Roman level. He's a two-time world medalist that has reignited the U.S. Greco squad with his recent success. Well, yeah, I wrestle Greco-Roman, which is <clears throat> attacks just using the upper body. Uh, can't go and grab legs or use your legs to, uh, to trip them or to in any kind of way. And uh, 
like he said, kind of trying to lead the charge. We've, we've had a number of years where we hadn't got any medals, and uh, after five years with no medals, I was able to take third uh, in 2014, and then took third again this last year. And I'm excited to to be that be that guy, but I think there's a number of of athletes right there ready to to follow, and uh, it's exciting. Wrestling fans, sit tight. We have an NCAA preview with our friend Richard Emmel. That's after this short timeout. You're watching Global Wrestling News, presented by Under Armour. All right, welcome back. USA Wrestling's Richard Emmel joins us now to preview the 2016 NCAA Championships. What's up, guys? Richard Emmel, USA Wrestling here. Going to break down these NCAA brackets for you, give you my picks, a uh, little look at the team race, uh, and, and just give you some insight, some tidbits that you'll need as you head into New York City uh, this weekend. At 125 pounds, I really like Thomas Gilman to take it. Going to have him over Nico Megalutis in that... Uh, championship final. Uh, obviously that means Gilman Tomasello in the semifinal. You have Gilman edging Tomasello who's been undefeated money all year. Um, and that other semifinal, Megalutis over Dance. You know, I just, I, I think that's the way to go. I'm gonna give Nico the edge over Dance there, the experience factor senior year. Uh, but Gilman, I think, talented enough to pull it through. Moving up to 133 pounds, um, Another tough semifinal bout could go back and forth. Cody Brewer of Oklahoma is the four seed, taking on Nashawn Garrett of Cornell, the number one seed, undefeated senior, uh, bumped up from 125 to 33. I'm going Brewer with this one, um, taking the defending NCAA champion at this weight class. Uh, Garrett's money defeated Brewer at the Cliff King Las Vegas, so that was a crazy match, one of the best matches of the year. Uh, but. I, I rely on Brewer when it comes to uh, NCAA tournament time. See John Morrison two years ago. See last year when he stormed through that bracket from the 13 spot. Uh, Brewer is going to take it over Corey Clark in the uh, championship finals there in a rematch of last year's finals. Moving up to 141, uh, probably the most exciting weight class top to bottom. I've, I've got Joey McKenna coming from the number two seed to win the whole thing over Dean Heil in the finals. Uh, Dean Heil is the number one seed. Those two have met two times already. Heil's won both matchups, but I really like McKenna uh, moving forward in this weight class. But watch out, I'm calling one of the first four seeds to lose that first day, first or second round uh, between Heil, McKenna, uh, Ashnault, and Mays. Uh, those are your top four seeds. Uh, someone, someone's going down there. So bumping up to 149, basically you got Zane Rutherford in the field. Uh, so I'm taking Zane to storm through that. Um, picking Sertis to make the finals there. I think he's got a favorable draw. I would have Kalika second round, um, and then would have to beat probably LeVon Mays in that quarterfinal there to push through to the uh, semi against Sorensen. He has a good track record against Sorensen. Uh, so even though he's had a tough year, I'm picking Sertis to get to the finals, but Rutherford to uh, get the W in the end. Moving up to 57. Let's just skip ahead, Nolf Imar, part three. Uh, no disrespect to anyone else in the field. Tommy Gantz undefeated, great wrestler, but I think Nolf takes him in the semifinal. I'm taking Imar in the rematch. I think that win at Big Tens is really what he needed. Got that confidence back, he's got his mojo back. He'll take it over Nolf uh, in the 157 finals. 65, Alex Derringer, uh, he's gonna pick up his third NCAA title. I like him over Isaac Jordan in the finals. Up at 174. Another one of these uh, weight classes that could go any way. Pro expect a bracket buster uh, early on in the in the tournament at this weight class. Um, I'm taking number one seed freshman Bo Nickel of Penn State to win it all, but be careful with him. He's going to have a tough quarterfinal match. Zach Epperly 
uh, is who I have projected to make that quarterfinal. Epperly is very tough, very solid, very sneaky. Um, could potentially see an upset there. They have Nickel over Ramos in the semifinals, Nickel over Real Buto in the finals rematch of the Southern Scuffle. Moving up to 84, I think it's Gabe Dean, and then take your pick. Uh, whoever comes out of that bottom side of the bracket is, I mean, it's anyone's guess at this point. I'm projecting the winner of the Nate Brown, TJ Dudley second round match will make the finals. I picked Dudley over Brown, does have a win over Brown earlier in the season. Uh, was a tight win. Brown, obviously, your NCAA finalist last year. But I'll, I'll pick Dudley uh, to take it to the finals and then Dean to take it home and win the title. So that brings us to 197. Um, you have Jaden Cox, Morgan McIntosh. That's who I have in the finals. Um, Jaden Cox, NCAA champion. Morgan McIntosh, the guy who people think should win it all. He's undefeated. He's the number one seed. Uh, he's got a couple pitfalls that, that could befall him. Uh, Connor Hartman specifically, they would meet in the semifinals. Hartman does have the positive track record there over McIntosh. But I'm picking McIntosh to break through that, get to the finals. But I'm picking Cox to win it all at 197. And the big one, the big men in the garden. Uh, it's gonna come down to Kyle Snyder, the reigning world champion. Nick Wazdowski, the two-time NCAA champion, trying to make it three. And how many times have we seen a two-time NCAA champion at heavyweight go for three and become uh, unsuccessful in achieving that endeavor? Uh, Gwizdowski stopped Tony Nelson from picking up his third title uh, three years ago when he won his first as a sophomore. I think Kyle Snyder, as a sophomore, gonna do the same to Gwiz. He picks up the NCAA title in the marquee matchup of the tournament, Snyder over Gwiz uh, at 285 pounds. Quickly, uh, team standings, I think Penn State runs away with it. Uh, I project eight All-Americans for Penn State. Um, really, if, if that comes to fruition, no one else has a shot. Five finalists, two champs from my book. Um, second place, Oklahoma State with six All-Americans. Then I'm jumping down Ohio State with five All-Americans, Iowa with four All-Americans, NC State with four All-Americans, Virginia Tech in sixth place with uh, five All-Americans. Uh, so stay tuned. It's going to be big time in New York City. All right, Richard, thank you very much. We'll see you in New York City. Hope to see each and every one of you fans there as well. Next up, with a coach's point of view, Titan Mercury's Wayne Boyd with the Under Armour As I See It segment. So stay tuned. It's always good. All right, welcome back to the show. It's time, it's time for Hollywood Wayne Boyd. Wayne, how are you? I'm working hard. I'm moving this week. I got my W hat on. A lot of people think this stands for the Washington Generals or something, but it actually stands for Wayne. Wayne. I'm ready, Scott. What do you got for me? Well, Tony Hager's joining us, and he'll start the questioning hey, off. Tony. Metcalf and Gomez, this uh, ended in some controversy. Uh, Metcalf, in his interview after the, at the Pan Ams, said that there is um, you know, some things basically going behind the scenes that people are after him and uh, some corruption. Uh, ha what are your thoughts on the, the corruption just in senior level wrestling? Is there? I hate, I hate to laugh, but it's been going on for about 100 years. We're a little more sophisticated with it now, but there's still the Russians and the Iranians and the referees and and, and, and maybe even the Americans now. I, I'm telling you, it's not easy to win on an international level when, when they can fix something or make a call that makes a difference. And I know Metcalf was in a very, very close battle. He was just not wrestling for the championship. He was trying to qualify our weight for the Olympics. And that loss means we do, with the 65 kilo, one of our best weight classes here in the United States, is not scheduled to go to the Olympics at this point. We've got about two more chances. 
But I'm I'm starting to worry about Brent Metcalf. I mean, he's still one of our best wrestlers in the country. But I think I would have sent Steber, who finished silver in, in two events. I think I would have uh, sent Kennedy, maybe. I'm not sure Metcalf's still the guy at 65 kilos. So uh, tough break. If you don't want the referees to be able to c- control the match, uh, you you got to you got to beat people the way Burroughs beats people. Make no question about it. You can't let it be close because you can get cheated. The World Cup comes up June 11th through the 12th at the fabulous Forum in Los Angeles, and according to Johnny Ruggiano, things are really starting to cook. Yeah, we're getting a lot of good sponsors. We're getting some major sponsors. Uh, Under Armour uh, looks like they're going to get the uh, rights to sell all the products there, and they're going to write a big check. And we've got other people contributing, and all the coaches are excited. I think we're going to have a two-day sellout. You're looking at seven to 10,000 people a day for two days, and that's Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we're trying to make this a great event. And we're trying. We're working with LA24, who are excited about getting the Olympic bet, bid to LA. And this is going to be a showcase of champions, movie stars, and the best wrestlers ever. The best eight countries. If you're anywhere near Los Angeles, don't miss the World Cup, June 11th, June 12th. Over the last few weeks, we've encouraged people to write in that are watching this very program, Global Wrestling News, and they've been doing it, Wayne, and they've been writing into gwncontact at gmail.com for the right and the honor to wear a shirt. And we've been selecting the top five emails uh, for the last two weeks, and we have winners again this week. We're going to do it at least one more week. Uh, are you excited about the, uh, the contact people are writing in? I love to know people are watching. I it, that that really that really makes the show. And and uh, keep doing it. Keep writing in. We'll come up with something after we do the T-shirt thing. We'll do something else. We want your viewership. We're a little slow getting the shirts out. Don't worry about it. If you're at the NCAA championships, come by the Titan Mercury table. Tell me I owe you a T-shirt. Just come see us. Keep participating. Keep watching this show because Tony Hager and Scott Casper are the guys when it comes to wrestling news in America. And it's not going to be long, fans. You're going to start to see maybe even our own wrestling station. We're, we're doing big things. Things are moving well. And I'm really excited. Hollywood Wayne Boyd bringing it on behalf of Under Armour and Global Wrestling News each and every week from his palatial estate outside of Los Angeles. Where? I'm not going to tell you because you don't need to know where Wayne lives. It's top Nobody secret information. Has my address. I got about four girlfriends and, uh, you know, I have to keep things quiet. <laughs> Wayne, thank you. We love you. We'll see you in New York City. All right, let's go. NCAA Championships. All right, fans, if you remember, over the last couple of weeks, we asked you to email us for a free tight Mercury shirt from our friends at Under Armour. The response has been nothing short of phenomenal. This week's winners include Garrett and Gunnar Sales, Scott and Gable Shattuck, and Andy Prater. Congratulations and thanks for watching, especially to those of you in Canada, our friends north of the border. Now, if you want to be like these lucky winners, all you need to do is email us the information you see on your screen, and we'll pick five lucky winners to get some Titan Mercury gear from our friends at Under Armour. Well, time for just a quick time up. You're watching Global Wrestling News. It's time for our Under Armour Athlete of the Week. And this week, there was no question who that winner would be. Straight out of Compton, California, ladies and gentlemen, wrestling fans, Joey Davis is our Under Armour Athlete of the Week. No question about it. Davis became the first wrestler to win four national titles at Division II level by going undefeated in the process. He finished his college career 131 
and 0. All right, Kale Sanderson went 159 and 0 in Division 1 and the Division 3 level saw Marcus Lavoisier of Augsburg go 155 and 0. Who had the most impressive run of the three? Well, it's it's really hard to argue with Kale Sanderson doing what he did at the Division 1 level at the the level of competition throughout is a lot higher than a D2 or D3. Uh, you know, I think Marcus, honestly, was uh, the funner wrestler to watch. He was just dynamic, and uh, but when it comes down to the type of opponents that Kale had, that's easily the most impressive. Last week, we saw a dynasty continue at the NEI level, and Wartburg did the same this last weekend, winning their fifth title in the past six years, 12 total. Who did it better? Grandview dominated the NAIs. I mean, just dominated, really. Uh, they doubled the second place team uh, points. Uh, both is a pretty, really darn impressive, if you ask me. I think uh, the Division Three level has a really tougher competition. Uh, so, I mean, one has to argue that it, it was more impressive that Warburg did it like this. I think the third place team, they doubled the third place. Uh, Messiah was in second. You know, they were close, but Warburg really dominated. So they've got 12 titles total. Uh, Grandview's really just starting to create that dynasty, but Warburg, Warburg has it. But they both are like magnets now. I mean, these ki kids across the country want to wrestle for these guys. Well, it's funny you say that because I think the longer the runs happen, the bigger the rosters they get, this actually kind of hurts them because kids see how many people are you know, at 125 pounds, at 133, there might be six studs. So sometimes they're thinking, well, they're, I'm not gonna possibly get in this lineup until I'm a, a junior or a senior, where they can go somewhere else and they're the guy. I'll be, so, hey, I'll be the guy in the room at, at, at Iowa, I'll be the guy in the room at Penn State if I get a chance to be on a championship team. And that doesn't necessarily mean start. Well, everybody thinks differently when they go to college, I think. Somebody wants to be the guy that steps on that line and, and where's that thing? It and, and they want to be a four-year starter, but at these levels, the, these programs, very tough to do to have a freshman do all four years. All right, well, St. Cloud State goes back-to-back -back at the Division II championship. Where does this stack up in the record books for you? I, the, it's not like a Warburg or a Grandview. The Huskies have finished, though, the top ten eight times in the last, uh, since 2009. Right. They play second in 2011, 2012, 2013, so while they aren't on that level, they are just right there. I think if they would have won title, titles in those those one, three years that they finished runner-up, you could talk about that, but they're just right there. Maybe these back-to-back -back years could start that dynasty. Well, Tony, it says right here, we're out of time. We hope you have an amazing weekend watching wrestling, either in person or on ESPN. For all of us at Global Wrestling News, I'm Scott Casper. He's Tony Hager. We'll see you next week.